The chilling voicemail you just heard is one of the only clues left behind in a baffling case that still remains a mystery to this day. Our story begins in the very early hours of September 7th, 2015. 31-year-old Henry McCabe, an employee of the Department of Revenue in Moundsview, Minnesota, was at a nightclub with his friends. Earlier, Henry had spent the entire day with William Kennedy, and Kennedy was the last person to ever see Henry. It was just after 2 a.m. when he dropped Henry off at a local gas station's convenience store, a Super America, that wasn't too far from the club where they had spent the evening. What exactly happened next has remained a point of speculation for years. Right off the bat, something wasn't quite right. Kennedy had Henry's keys while another friend had his wallet. Presumably, they were all meant to meet up again, and Kennedy later claimed he took his keys to stop Henry from driving home impaired. But what all of this meant was that when Henry went to the convenience store, he didn't have any identification on him or the keys to his house, so there was no real way for him to get home. That same night, Corrine McCabe, Henry's wife, was away in California. The couple had been married for 11 years and they had two children together, a one-year-old and a 10-year-old. Corrine woke the following day to find that mysterious voicemail you heard earlier left on her phone from her husband at 2.28 a.m. The voicemail appears to be an accidental pocket dial and is almost entirely undecipherable noises, including growls and grunts for two minutes straight. For an unknown reason, just a short fragment of Henry's last voicemail has ever been publicly released, and only those close to the case have heard the entire two minutes. Though this hasn't been verified, some have speculated that Henry's family requested that the full voicemail not be shared with the public. The only clear sound is a voice that cuts through to say, stop it. Then the call ends. No one has heard from Henry since. He was officially reported missing the next day. Considering the odd circumstances, the police determined that his disappearance was highly suspicious. Immediately, investigators and volunteers began tracing the possible routes Henry may have taken from the convenience store, but they didn't find Henry or any clues about what happened to him. Since he was last seen just after 2 a.m. and the voicemail was left at 2.28, whatever happened to Henry during the voicemail was just moments after Kennedy dropped him off. With that in mind, and the fact that he was on foot, there should have been some clue to his fate near the convenience store, but nothing turned up. The next step was to try and trace the pings of his cell phone. It was uncovered that his phone had pinged off towers in Spring Lake Park, Fridley, and New Brighton, which somewhat narrowed down the search. Despite this development, it seemed like Henry had simply vanished into thin air. He didn't turn his phone back on, there was no activity in his bank account, and he never tried to contact his work, friends, or family. So, the only real clue investigators had was that strange voicemail. Corrine was sure that some of the sounds she heard had come from her husband because she recognized his voice, but the other noises, well, that's all up for debate. Some were certain they heard a gunshot in the background of the call. Had Henry been shot and killed? If so, by who? Something else was apparent in the voicemail. A single word, a name. Papus, which was a nickname for Henry's friend Kennedy. The question was, had Henry been calling for help from his friend, or was there something more sinister afoot? Everything changed in November 2015, about eight weeks after Henry had gone missing. A recreational kayaker on Rush Lake in New Brighton made a gruesome discovery. While on the water, the kayaker noticed a human body floating near some brush. Because the body was found near one of the locations marked by investigators looking for Henry, they were contacted when the body was found. The body appeared to have been in the water for some time, but following an investigation by the medical examiner, it was positively identified as Henry McCabe. What might be the strangest twist of all is that the medical report said that Henry's death did not appear to be suspicious because there were no signs of trauma or foul play. Despite the voicemail, there were no gunshot wounds or injuries of any kind, but his exact cause of death was still undetermined. Although this was puzzling, what was most confusing was the question of how Henry actually got to the lake, especially on foot. The lake where he was found is at least six miles from where he was dropped off at the store, which would easily take over an hour to walk. Since Henry was drinking that night, it likely took much longer. This is, of course, possible, except that the voicemail caught the sound of moans and screams just a short 20 minutes after he was dropped off. So what happened that led him to the lake? His death seems relatively straightforward. He accidentally drowned, right? That is exactly what the police theorized, saying that Henry's probable cause of death was drowning in fresh water. 
except it always comes back to that mysterious voicemail. David Singleton, the chief executive of Minnesota Community Policing Services, has said, I don't believe the idea that he just wandered that far on his own, and the audio doesn't support the idea that his death is not suspicious. The voicemail was sent to the FBI to aid in the analysis and to try and clean up the audio, but no helpful information ever arose. As investigators continued looking into the case, they found that they had one of the most crucial details wrong from the beginning. It turns out that the location Kennedy gave for where he dropped Henry off was actually incorrect. The police found video surveillance that showed it was a holiday gas station at a different location and not a Super America. Slight difference, right? And an easy mistake to make, especially after a night of partying, except that this kind of detail meant everything in Henry's case. There might have been evidence at the correct location if the police had been looking at the right spot from the beginning. The actual gas station Henry was dropped off at was about three miles away from where investigators originally thought. It was much farther from his house, but closer to where his body was discovered. Still, it was likely about a four-mile walk from the Holiday gas station to Rush Lake, which wouldn't have been an easy feat for Henry. During the investigation, Kennedy eventually handed over Henry's keys and wallet, but he never offered an explanation for why he dropped Henry off at the convenience store rather than simply back at home. As for giving the wrong location, well, that has just been explained as a mistake. Kennedy may know more about Henry's disappearance than he let on. The fact that he didn't give any kind of explanation as to why he left Henry at the gas station instead of taking him home is a red flag. Most people who are the last person to see a missing person alive, especially when it's a friend, would want to do everything possible to help with the investigation. It's possible that giving the wrong gas station location was a genuine mistake, but it's also possible that it was done on purpose to mislead police. If Kennedy really was concerned enough that he took Henry's keys to stop him from driving under the influence as he claimed, it seems highly questionable that he would then leave him miles from home, with no money or identification. Unfortunately, with no additional information, we can only speculate about what happened. The bizarre voicemail does suggest that there is much more to this case than an accidental drowning. But Kennedy wasn't the only person who may have misled investigators, whether accidentally or not. The Minnesota Community Policing Services initially offered a $10,000 reward for information about Henry's case, but they removed it after a falling out with Henry's wife, Kareen. Singleton alleged that the decision was made because of, quote, her willingness to mislead the public and this committee. The exact alleged misleadings have never been publicly released, but Kareen has maintained that she has been honest with the police throughout the investigation. With such little information, there are multiple theories about what happened to Henry, and some are more plausible than others. Investigators have looked into the possibility that Henry's death was an accident, or that he'd intentionally taken his own life by drowning. His wife has said that she doesn't buy that idea, saying, I don't think somebody would just drown himself. Somebody was inflicting harm. However, other theories, mostly shared online on Reddit, are that Henry's death was caused by an animal attack, or that the growling on the voicemail was really the sounds of screaming from underwater or gurgling. Others think that the clicking noise is a taser gun and that the voice may be garbled because Henry had just been tased. All of this is guesswork, but with so many questions still remaining in the case, namely what was really happening during that eerie voicemail, people can't help but wonder about the truth. And the truth is something that we just may never know. With that, let's move on to our second case of the day, one that's a good reminder that sometimes things aren't always as they seem because sometimes they are much, much worse. On the evening of November 27, 2010, a Royal Canadian Mounted Police officer was sitting on the back roads near Vanderhoof, British Columbia, Canada, when they noticed a vehicle speeding out of a remote logging road. This was especially odd because the area was known to be quiet, especially at 9.45 p.m. There was no reason for a truck to be speeding, so, following a hunch, the officer pulled the truck over in a routine traffic stop, but what happened next was nothing close to routine. The driver was 20-year-old Cody Lechbakov. He likely would have been let off with a warning for speeding, except for one thing. When the officer approached the truck, they saw what looked like a smear of blood on Cody's face. But that's not all. There was also blood on Cody's legs and what looked like a pool of blood in the truck. 
The Fourth Amendment's protection against unlawful search and seizure prohibits arbitrary vehicle searches by police. If the police search your car without a warrant, your permission, or a valid reason, they're violating your constitutional rights. However, there are some situations in which police can search a car without a warrant or your consent. When it comes to vehicle searches, courts generally give police more leeway compared to when police are attempting to search a residence. This is because under the automobile exception to the search warrant requirement, courts have recognized that individuals have a lower expectation of privacy when driving a car than when they're in their homes. Police can conduct warrantless searches of your vehicle under the following circumstances. You've given the officer consent to do so. The officer has probable cause to believe there is evidence of a crime in your vehicle. The officer reasonably believes a search is necessary for their own protection, a hidden weapon for example, and if you've been arrested and the search is related to that arrest, such as a search for illegal drugs. Seeing the blood, the officer called for backup, and he was joined by a second officer. Together they searched the truck where they also found tools that looked like they were covered in blood. But here's the thing. Cody immediately told the officers what had happened. He had a perfectly reasonable, if illegal, explanation for the blood and his speeding. Cody said he had just been poaching and killed a deer by clubbing it to death. He was speeding away from the crime when he was pulled over. When officers asked him why exactly he clubbed a deer to death, he reportedly said simply, I'm a redneck, that's what we do for fun. Unsurprisingly, Cody was arrested under the Canada Wildlife Act for poaching. But something was missing. There was no deer carcass in Cody's truck as one would expect with a poacher, because that was the whole point, wasn't it? So, where was the deer? A conservation officer who had experienced tracking animals was called in to find the deer while Cody was taken into custody. The officer began tracing the tire tracks of Cody's truck back up the remote side road he'd been fleeing from. There, in the fresh snow, he found footprints. As he followed the tracks, he expected to find the body of a deer, but instead, he stumbled upon something he never expected to see. Partially buried near a gravel pit was the body of a young woman. The girl's pants had been pulled down, and she appeared to have injuries to her head. She was already dead by the time the officer found her. It was 15-year-old Lauren Don Leslie. The teen was legally blind as she didn't have any vision in one of her eyes and only about 50% vision in the other. Lauren's body was left near a highway known in Canada as the Highway of Tears, an area notorious for young women going missing or being killed. Following an autopsy, it was confirmed that Lauren had died from blunt force trauma to her head and blood loss from her wounds. If there was any doubt that Cody had been fleeing from the area of Lauren's body, investigators reportedly found a monkey backpack inside his truck, as well as a wallet with a children's hospital card that had the name Lauren Leslie on it, a pair of glasses that belonged to Lauren, Lauren's phone, and a ring her father had made for her with all the birthstones of their family. At first, Cody explained that he'd found Lauren by accident, already dead, while he was out poaching in the woods. But this wasn't true. Police checked his phone and realized that not only had they known each other before he found her body, but that Lauren and Cody had exchanged text messages back and forth planning to meet up that very night. The two had met on the social media site Nexopia, where Cody messaged Lauren first. After chatting for a bit, they exchanged phone numbers before they agreed to meet in person. That evening, before meeting Lauren, Cody bought a four-pack of Kahlua mudslides, a four-pack of white Russians, and a pack of cigarettes. Keep in mind, Lauren was 15 and it was not legal for her to consume alcohol. Providing alcohol to a minor is typically punished as a misdemeanor offense. However, the crime may also be considered a felony depending on the circumstances of the case and the state or country in which it occurs. The difference between a misdemeanor and a felony offense typically rests on whether anyone was seriously injured or killed as a result of the illegal supplying of alcohol. Felony offenses can also result when a person has committed repeated offenses. When presented with this information, Cody changed his story, admitting that they had hung out together. He claimed the two had engaged in what he described as consensual intercourse, though of course, with Lauren being a minor and Cody an adult, this couldn't be consensual. Their text messages also contradicted Cody's story. Just before they actually met, Cody told Lauren not to tell anyone that they were going to hang out, and she replied in a text, well, we're just hanging out, right? Nothing inappropriate which contradicted Cody's claim they had a consensual encounter. But none of this actually explained how Lauren died and ended up being left down a lonely logging road. Cody once again told the police another story. 
As you'll see, it would turn out that he told a lot of stories. This time, though, he said that as they drove down the road where her body was found, Lauren suddenly became agitated. He claimed she was so worked up that she started hitting herself with a wrench from his truck and then stabbed herself with a knife in an attempt to take her own life. Cody said that after hitting herself, Lauren got out of his truck and disappeared from his view. He found her lying on her stomach with a knife next to her. She was still alive but appeared to be dying, so he claimed that he struck her twice in the head with the wrench to put her out of her misery. What a nice guy. Then he just left her body there and sped away. The discovery of Lauren's body opened up a whole other investigation that no one saw coming. While Cody was in custody, investigators started looking closely at his apartment. And while there, they found something curious. A pickaxe. This wasn't too surprising, but when the pickaxe was tested for DNA evidence, it came back that it had traces of human blood on it. And not only that, but the blood's DNA also had a match, though not to Lauren, as one may assume. Instead, it matched a woman whose body had been found on October 8, 2010, in a park on the outskirts of Prince George. The woman was 35-year-old Cynthia Frances Moss. She was last seen on September 10, 2010, a month before her body was found. Police have said that Cynthia was involved with drugs and prostitution. So, how had Cynthia's DNA ended up on a pickaxe in Cody's apartment? Well, that explanation will come later, because it wasn't the only piece of DNA evidence investigators found. Obviously, after discovering the pickaxe, the police wanted to be extremely thorough with everything else in Cody's apartment. So, after testing his shirts, shorts, bed sheets, a comforter, and even another axe, they found more DNA. This DNA was matched to another person entirely, 23-year-old Natasha Lynn Montgomery, a young woman who was missing. Natasha was last seen as she left a friend's house in Prince George in August of 2010. Natasha's body was never found, but now that her DNA was discovered at Cody's apartment, police were confident she'd befallen the same fate as Lauren and Cynthia and was likely deceased. Oh, but that's not all. If you thought all of that was crazy, just wait. When running Cody's DNA through police databases, investigators found that he matched a semen sample collected from a body, but not Cynthia's or Lauren's. No, Cody's DNA was found on the body of 35-year-old Jill Stachenko. Jill had disappeared from Prince George on October 9, 2009. At the end of the month, on the 26th, her body was uncovered where it had been half buried in a gravel pit just outside of the city. Lauren, Jill, and Cynthia had all suffered blunt force trauma to their heads, as well as other wounds. All the women, except for Lauren, were characterized in the news as drug users and sex workers. Cody was now connected to the deaths of four different young women, all killed within the last two years, but nothing about him would make you think he was the kind of person to do something like this, at least from the outside. For one, his childhood had been typical. Growing up, Cody got along with his parents and siblings. He worked in a sawmill run by his grandfather and his great uncle, and he had an active social life playing hockey, hunting, and fishing. At the time that he was arrested, he worked as a mechanic at a Ford dealership. As the news broke, Cody became known as the country boy killer for the comments he made when he was first pulled over. A key characteristic of a psychopath is the ability to blend in to normal society. Psychopaths are often charming and well-liked by others. They may have stable employment and appear to have relationships with family and friends. However, this is all an elaborate act. A true psychopath can form an emotional attachment to other people, but they are very good at pretending. Another trait of a psychopath is pathological lying, which is seen in this case with Cody changing his story multiple times. Promiscuous relations, lack of remorse, and lack of empathy are additional psychopathic traits. Cody was charged with the first-degree murder of all four women, and the case went to trial. Throughout, he remained impassive, never showing any signs of emotion, and it was in court that the rest of Cody's stories came out. His lawyer argued that Cody should be found guilty of second-degree murder, not first. This was because Cody freely admitted that he was involved in the deaths of the three women. He stuck to his story about Lauren, claiming she went flying off the handle that night and had been the one to take her own life while in his truck. Failing to accept responsibility for one's actions is another psychopathic trait. For the other three, Cody argued that he wasn't the one who did the actual killing. Instead, he said that it was a drug dealer and two other accomplices who killed each of the women on different occasions. 
but he refused to name them because he was afraid of retribution if he did. Even when the judge threatened that he would be held in contempt of court if he didn't say who the other men were, Cody refused. Apparently, he didn't want to be labeled as a rat while in prison and told the court that revealing their names was just not in the cards. There is no legal obligation to snitch on your accomplices. However, a defendant could be charged with contempt of court if they agree to disclose information in accordance with a plea agreement and then refuse to do so. Even though he never named the alleged real killers, Cody still told the court a few tall tales. In one, he said that after a party, Jill had stayed to hang out at his apartment with a few other people. He said that as they were in another room, an unnamed person told him that Jill had to be killed because she owed a lot of money. Cody, who said he tried cocaine for the first time that night, claimed to have just handed the person a pipe from his toolbox and then simply watched as this other person hit Jill in the head with it and then choked her to death. Cody alleged that his only involvement was breaking Jill's cell phone in half, carrying her body with this other person into his truck, and then dumping her corpse. Then, as if this was a perfectly normal evening, he just carried on like nothing happened, cleaning his apartment to get rid of the blood, which he struggled to get out of the couch and carpet, and then went to Thanksgiving with his family the next day. Yeah, all sounds like it adds up, right? And guess what? Apparently, almost this exact same thing happened a year later, or so Cody claims. This time, it was Cynthia Francis Moss who was killed by an unnamed someone else. These stories are likely further examples of Cody's pathological lying. As it turns out, no one bought his wild stories or his claim that someone else had done all the killing, and he just happened to be there every time. Cody Lejbikov was found guilty on four counts of first-degree murder. Cody was only 19 when he killed for the first time. In British Columbia, first-degree murder carries a mandatory sentence of life without eligibility for parole for 25 years. Cody's sentences will be served concurrently. The four convictions make Cody one of Canada's youngest serial killers. In case you're curious, here are eight red flags of a psychopath to look out for. 1. Superficial charm. Psychopaths are generally likable. Their personalities can be engaging and they have the ability to draw in those around them. But you may feel a little twinge in your gut that something is off. 2. Grandiosity. The psychopath may be very arrogant and self-centered. Those around them might just think the psychopath is very confident. 3. Need for stimulation. Psychopaths crave excitement and they may make frequent changes to their plans. They may appear restless and it may seem like they're surrounded by drama. It's also common for psychopaths to drink alcohol and or use drugs. 4. Pathological lying. Not only do psychopaths frequently lie, but they don't appear to be bothered when someone catches them in a lie. They may also lie just for the sake of lying. 5. Manipulation. Psychopaths have an uncanny ability to get other people to do their bidding or give them what they want. They can also be very controlling. 6. Parasitic lifestyle. Most people need help from friends or family from time to time. However, if someone is constantly relying on other people to provide for them financially, that can be a red flag. 7. Promiscuous behavior and or having many short-term marital relationships. Due to a psychopath's high need for stimulation and impulsive behavior, they may have a large number of partners in their history. 8. Refusing to take responsibility. Psychopaths try to put the blame on anyone but themselves. They often play the victim in order to manipulate the people around them. Any of these traits alone could be caused by multiple other reasons. However, when these signs are seen together, it can indicate that you may be dealing with a psychopath. Unfortunately, psychopaths are notoriously known for being good at blending into society, so they can be quite difficult to recognize. Sometimes the most important thing you can do is trust your gut. So, if you know much about British Columbia's checkered history of famous serial killers, that last case may not have been too surprising for you. However, I know you won't see today's final case coming. Though it may seem like a typical missing persons case, the dark rumors surrounding it are nothing short of straight out of a horror movie. When a friend couldn't track down 33-year-old Cassidy Rainwater, they reported her missing on August 25th, 2021. Cassidy had been staying at a house on Moon Valley Road near Buffalo, Missouri, owned by James Phelps. The last time anyone saw Cassidy was six weeks before she was reported missing, and she was with Phelps at the time. 
As soon as she was reported missing, police began looking for Cassidy, and an officer went to check the cabin where she was supposed to be staying. The police believe that Cassidy may have been with Phelps as early as the beginning of July. However, there was no sign of her on the property, so the officer left. If only he had looked just a little bit closer. After a week with no other clues to her whereabouts, the investigators headed back to the house on Moon Valley Road, and this time they come across Phelps. Phelps admitted that Cassidy had been staying with him at the cabin until she could get back on her feet, but he said it had only been for a short period of time. He claimed that Cassidy was already long gone. She had left at the end of July in the middle of the night when a mysterious car arrived at the house. Phelps said that Cassidy got into the vehicle and left without saying a word to him. He didn't know where she was headed, but told the police that she'd been talking about possibly going to Colorado. Phelps was very clear about one thing, though. He said he hadn't seen her since then, but that would turn out not to be the case. Phelps was likely trying to steer investigators away from his property by giving them information that Cassidy not only left, but likely went out of state, which would make her more difficult to track down. So, even if they hadn't found her, the police had a lead. For two more weeks, no one managed to track down Cassidy in Colorado, or anywhere else for that matter. When a clue about Cassidy finally came in, it wasn't what anyone expected. The FBI received an anonymous cyber tip of photos that showed Cassidy partially naked in a cage, but alive, and then another showing her body with evidence of mutilation. They only became more gruesome from there. Another photo was of Cassidy's body bound to a gantry crane device, a machine usually used to process wild game. Just as horrible, other images showed her body being eviscerated and dismembered. It's possible that the killer released these photos to the police as a way of bragging about what they got away with. It's also possible that someone else who knew the killer somehow gained access to the photos, but submitted them anonymously out of fear of repercussion from the killer. Cassidy wasn't just missing. She had been killed in the most horrific way possible. A few days after the photos were received, James Phelps and another man, Timothy Norton, were arrested and charged with the felony kidnapping of Cassidy. In the following weeks, skeletal remains were uncovered in Phelps' cabin. The body was determined to be Cassidy. Given the gruesome photos, this wasn't too much of a surprise, even if it wasn't the outcome everyone was hoping for. Her cause of death was later determined to be strangulation. But here's the thing. Evidence shows that Cassidy had actually been killed around July 24th, about a month before she was even reported missing. And that's not all. Investigators claim they found the same scene from the photographs of Cassidy at the Moon Valley Road property. A gantry crane, a cage, and what appeared to be blood. Investigators said that they also found images on Phelps' phone similar to the photos they had been anonymously sent. Most horrifying of all, when the police looked inside of a freezer, they said they found what appeared to be human flesh. Now, that's a lot to stomach, but add in the fact that the human flesh was also dated 724, and we're talking about the kind of stuff you only see in horror movies. Following DNA testing, the remains were identified as Cassidy's. The discovery of human remains in the freezer fueled rumors that her killers allegedly planned to cannibalize her body, or already had. After these discoveries, both Phelps and Norton were officially charged with the first-degree murder of Cassidy and the abandonment of a corpse on top of the kidnapping charge. Police allege that during interrogation, Norton almost immediately confessed that he helped to restrain Cassidy while she was killed. Police say that Norton claimed she was sleeping when she was attacked. Reportedly, Norton stated a plastic bag was placed over her head. At the same time, he physically restrained Cassidy by holding her down for a substantial period of time, while Phelps allegedly strangled her. Authorities say that just like the photos showed, Norton told the police that her body was then hung from the gantry crane, where she was disemboweled. The two men then allegedly carried her body to a bathtub, where it was dismembered. Phelps, on the other hand, refused to speak to investigators without an attorney, and then refused to answer questions altogether. Still, investigators said they found text messages exchanged between the two men, where they allegedly planned to kill Cassidy on July 24th. Police say that Phelps had asked for Norton's help. This is all the information that has been publicly released by investigators, but there may be more going on with this case. At least, that's the unconfirmed rumor. The case took another turn when on October 4th, 2021, the cabin on Moon Valley Road was set on fire. The responding fire marshals concluded that the fire was a case of arson, and yet no one has been arrested. 
Two explosive devices made out of mortar tubes, balloon covers, and trip wires were discovered on the property near the house. The sheriff said that the house was totally lost in the fire, and with it, possibly potential evidence in Cassidy's case. As Cassidy was a mother of at least two children, there's been a lot of concern online about what has happened to her kids since her death. It appears that at least one of her children was already in the care of adoptive parents, and his family is trying to protect him from the grisly news of Cassidy's death. For now, it's important to remember that Phelps and Norton have not been found guilty of any crime, and therefore remain innocent unless and until they are found guilty.